1. Take caution reading this story if you have scopophobia. My experience might trigger paranoid thoughts. Stay safe. I have a phobia that goes by a few names. Scopophobia. Ophthalmophobia. The fear of being watched. I have this weird compulsion. Whenever I see a doorway, a window, or virtually any surface that I believe someone could hide behind, I imagine a face peering out at me. Staring. I imagine what I would do, what could I do. You will soon find out why I have this phobia. On to the story. I will try my best to remember all the details, but my mind has repressed a lot of it. Around June of 2016, my mother and I were living in a small apartment. There was no basement or attic, obviously, but there was one tiny crawl space in the closet floor of my bedroom. I never looked in it. I suppose some people would be overwhelmed with curiosity, but my mind had already imagined all the worst scenarios. I decided to leave whatever dead bodies and ghosts were down there for whoever rented after us. It was a nice apartment, small but perfect for the two of us. We lived there for a few peaceful months until the noises started. It was nothing extreme, just the odd bump in the night, and particularly scratching. My mom just brushed it off as rats in the walls. As long as they stayed in there, I saw no reason to get rid of them. A week or two later, I had already grown used to the noise. It became almost comforting in a way. After all, I never really liked silence. That is until I awoke one night to a different noise. A rolling sound, eerily similar to the sound my closet made when I opened it. I peeked my eyes open and looked over. But I couldn't make out anything in the dark. I thought maybe I saw something move. But I was well aware of how the mind plays tricks on you in the dark. There was only one way to find out. I turned on my lamp. I feel like crying just writing this out. It's been almost a year since I've had to recall this night. When I turned on the light, I expected to just see a closet full of coats. But what I saw was much, much worse. It was an eye. Not just an eye, but the entire half of someone's face barely visible in the tiny crack he had opened. He didn't even react to being caught. No smile, no fear. Just watching. My heart has never beat faster than that night. I wish I screamed, or maced him, or anything. But I just stared back, frozen in time until I couldn't hold it in anymore. I began sobbing loudly. I think I try to say something along the lines of, what do you want? But it was garbled by my crying. He opened the door more. I could now see his entire body, which I don't care to describe, as I've spent two long years trying to forget that face. Shh. I lost my breath at that. Hearing him made it real. I couldn't pretend this was some fucked up hallucination anymore. At this, I sat up and pressed my back against the wall. It's okay, scared Sprout. He said it so cheerfully it gives me chills just remembering it. This is when I finally had the courage to run out of the room. This creep knew my name. My fucking name! My mom, still half asleep while she called the police, thought I had imagined it. Of course, by the time the police got there, he was already gone. All that was left of him was that damned crawl space. I still never looked inside. Although writing this now, I kind of wish I did. Having some sort of proof of this would, I don't know, comfort me? Because at least you would all know I'm not crazy. Apparently he had been living in there, for how long I don't know. But the officers who first arrived on the scene said that there were tally marks inside the crawl space. I didn't want to know how many. I didn't want to know whether he was marking days or weeks. I just wanted to leave that fucking apartment. And we did. The police never found him, not for certain. 
They thought they found a homeless man who matched his description, but he was apparently unresponsive. I've always thought they didn't take it all that seriously. They just thought he was a squatter, even after I told them that he knew my name. They thought that given how long he had seemingly been squatting, he had probably just heard my name through the floorboards. Since that night, he has been the face that I always see when there's an open door or closet. It's grown more distorted as time goes on, but I can always make out a part of his pursed lips, as if he's still shushing me, even now. It's gotten easier with time, but I don't think it will ever leave me completely. Anyways, I guess we didn't actually have rats. 2. I was in my mid-twenties in the summer of 2007, and living just outside one of the most dangerous cities in the country. I moved there for a job, and was from a very small town in another state, and therefore somewhat naive about danger. I loved my apartment. It was newish, and I felt safe there at first. I chose the third floor specifically because I wanted a high balcony. Me and my three cats and chihuahua used to go out in the evenings and sit on the floor of the balcony, didn't have a chair, and enjoy the weather and view. On Friday evening, I was out there after work and happened to overhear a conversation between a young girl on the second floor, directly below me, and a guy who was walking through the yard below. I kid you not, her parents were out of town and she was having a secret house party, just like on the movies. She told him what time the party was starting, and asked him to bring some beer, drugs, and friends, and he said he would. I thought nothing of this and went inside to watch Judge Judy. After dark that night, probably between 10.30 and midnight, I took my pets and went to sit on the balcony as we often did. Party girl below me had her sliding glass door open and her party was hopping and loud. After eavesdropping for a little while, I heard two men come out onto the balcony and start talking. This is kind of weird because it's almost like they knew I was up there snooping and wanted me to hear them. But I don't know how they would have known. I was being extra quiet, so at most they might have heard my dog's toenails tapping around. It's been a long time, so I can't remember verbatim what was said. But I remember hearing one guy say something about a bitch upstairs. I heard them say something about drugs or something like, Let's go pay them a visit since we're here. Ooh, drama. Wait a minute. I'm upstairs. This made me uncomfortable, so I listened for them to go in and I grabbed my critters and went inside too. I walked over to my door and checked both locks, just in case. As I walked through the hall to the bathroom, I heard boom, boom, boom on my door. At this point, my life turns into a scary movie and everything goes into slow motion. I'm staring at the door, and again I hear boom, boom, boom on the door and the rattle, rattle, rattle of the doorknob. And this time it didn't stop for several seconds. I had no clue what to do. So I did the dumb thing and walked gingerly across the carpet toward the door, careful not to make a sound, and looked out the peephole. There were two rough-looking men at the door, presumably the ones from downstairs. While I had my face pressed against the door watching them, one of them turned like he was going to walk away but instead built up momentum and rammed the door with all his might. I felt it budge against me and I almost pissed myself. My chihuahua, who had only been growling a little up until this point, started screaming bloody murder, which subsequently made the creepers react, almost as if for a second they thought the apartment might have been empty, but now they knew it was occupied. Then the other guy approached and began donkey kicking the door, when you turn your back to a door and knock by kicking your foot against the door. This had been going on for what seemed like forever, and I swear the door was going to give way. I was still watching them when I realized that if they got in, not only would they probably butcher me, but they'd probably also kill Ziggy, Scabby, Cheeseball, and Shion, the Chihuahua. So I got mad. I did something I didn't think I'd ever really have to do. Don't read any further if you're super sensitive about weapons. 
My ex-boyfriend and I liked to shoot at the quarry back home, and I had a couple of guns in cases under my bed. I crept into the bedroom, trying to keep an ear and eye on the door, pulled out a case, loaded my 45, and walked back to the front door, which they were still pounding and trying to jerk open. I can't say what was scarier at that point, the creepy people pounding down the door, or the fact that I might have to protect myself and hurt another human being. I looked at the peephole to see them still there, talking, couldn't hear them, and with my face against the door I pulled the hammer back. I guess it's not impossible that they heard it, but then again, I couldn't hear them talking to each other. I don't know why, but they communicated again for a second and ran, not walked, away. After I heard the stairwell door shut behind them, I sighed a big sigh of relief and began to cry. I called the police and waited for them to come to my door so I could report what happened. After putting all the clues together, it really seemed as if these guys were looking for a former tenant who might have been a drug dealer, or someone who owed them money for drugs. Luckily, nothing else ever came out of it, and I never saw those guys again. Now, there is one thing I left out, since I don't know if it makes much difference. But this particular town was full of what we used to call skinheads. Very bad guys with swastika tattoos somewhere on their body that would always be visible. I'm pretty sure those guys were skinheads. So creepy guys, for my sake, and yours, let's not ever meet. 3. For a little bit of background info, I am a junior in college, originally from the US, studying abroad in Hong Kong. Though battling a minor language barrier, I immediately fell in love with the vibrant city. It didn't take long to feel at home and get familiar with my surroundings. After a matter of weeks, I was practically a local. I'm reluctant to say that in exchange for feeling so comfortable in the area, I may have let my guard down in the process. Being a 5'6", 120 pound female, I recognize the importance of staying vigilant, especially when venturing out on my own. Though pretty athletic, I am not much of a threat against anyone that may want to hurt me, which leads me to the encounter I had some weeks ago. I decided to head over to a smaller mall to kill time one afternoon, while my friends were in class. When I say small, I mean in comparison to some of the massive retail metropolises located elsewhere in the city. This place was still no joke. I had begun to frequent this mall, as it was not a far trip and an easy place to visit with a couple of hours to spare, so I knew the place pretty well. Also important, Hong Kong is fairly diverse compared to most places in Asia. But being blonde and white, I get a lot of stares. I am usually one of the few if any white people around whenever I leave campus, especially in the areas with small numbers of tourists. This makes other people of the same race stand out to me in a crowd as well, which is why that afternoon I had noticed two white men showing up in the same place as I was. Now, before you roll your eyes, this mall was good-sized, but small enough where that wasn't particularly unusual. A lot of major stores are in the same area, so I figured they were shopping around like I was. I didn't get that eerie I'm being watched feeling and I wasn't even sure that they had noticed my presence whatsoever. I hadn't caught them looking my way even once. Besides, I have a pretty good sixth sense about these kinds of situations. After growing up in some major cities, my parents made damn sure stranger danger was ingrained into my brain as a child, and that I knew exactly what to do if I found myself in trouble. I was aware of the men, but I wasn't worried. An hour or so after I had last noticed the two men, I was milling around, Starbucks and a few shopping bags in hand, mostly people watching at this point and debating whether or not it was time to go back to campus. To avoid the crowd and getting bumped into, lack of awareness for personal space seems to be a common thing here, I went slightly out of the way to walk through a quieter walkway that passed by a couple of luxury stores and an exit. Let me emphasize, there were still plenty of people around. They just happened to be further to my right, while the luxury stores and exit were to my left. I'm still wandering, lost in my thoughts. When someone coming from my right bumps into me. Seriously? With all this empty space around? But this time there were fingernails digging into my ribcage. They hadn't just bumped into me, they latched on. 
Whoever it was behind me was walking perpendicular to my previous path. Their right hand was positioned under my right arm, pushing or pulling me with them. To any passerby, he was positioned strategically enough that you probably couldn't even tell what was going on. He knew exactly what he was doing. It took me a minute to register what was happening, especially since I couldn't see the assailant from their position behind me. Once I snapped out of it, I was stunned. I stumbled along with him for a moment, trying to shake loose. This guy was strong. Victim to his steel-tight grip, all 120 pounds of me was not going anywhere, besides exactly where he wanted me. Fear seized my mind and body as his massive grip tightened and those long fingernails delved deeper into my skin. Then a confident, gravelly voice that was enough to make anyone's skin crawl barked into my ear. Do not fight. I will win. At this point, I'm panicking. I manage to look behind me, and who do I see but one of the six-foot-five white muscle men from before? Big surprise, I know. He snarls at me and slams his left hand in the same position under my left arm. I look towards where we're headed and see the other equally as monstrous white man posted up waiting for us, right under the illuminated sign that read Exit. I heard a family friend, who used to live in Hong Kong, voice in my head, You will see sex trafficking while you're there, it's everywhere, but as long as you're careful you'll be fine. A warning he had headed before I left. Fuck, 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 fuck! Suddenly that panic that had created a fog around my brain turned to pure adrenaline. I was no longer scared, I was pissed. Not thinking, rather operating on autopilot. I gathered a strength I didn't know I had and ripped free from the veteran kidnapper's grip. I would like to say I ran like hell to get help, but again this was my hyped up adrenaline ridden brain acting. I whipped around mere feet away from my attacker and glared at this man as if saying try that shit again I dare you. If looks could kill. He looked absolutely stunned that I had managed to pull free, but at this point the interaction was no longer disguised as a normal encounter. More people were around, and without the opportunity to make it appear as if I was acting of my own accord, he knew he missed his chance. He glared back momentarily, but motioned to his buddy, and they booked it out the exit without their intended target. Just as fast as it had come, the adrenaline rush was gone. I was shaking uncontrollably, fighting back tears, his touch burning into my flesh long after he had gone. I looked around me. Stunned, no one had stopped to help or even witnessed what had just happened. I took a moment to compose myself physically. My mental state was another story. And slowly and vigilantly walked my shaking self back to the bus that would return me to my safe haven on campus. While I can't say for certain what their intentions were, I have a pretty good guess. I can only pray the next girl is as lucky as I. Edit. I forgot to mention that I did end up talking to mall security that put me in contact with law enforcement. I did not think to include this information when I first posted, which I now realize is a pretty important detail to omit. I was hesitant at first, for I didn't expect that there would be much they were able to do. While there wasn't, I felt it was my responsibility to at least try to help prevent this from happening again. Some of you are also questioning the validity of this story. For reference, I am an engineer major and am heavily lacking in imagination. While I wish I was lucky enough to be blessed with the talent, creative writing is unfortunately something I have never been good at. Let me clarify, due to his desire to be discreet, the places the assailant had a hold on me allowed me a lot of leverage to twist in a way that his arms were unable to bend in order to escape his grasp. I think attention to detail is incredibly important in drawing awareness of how terrifying these kinds of encounters are. And after talking it over with so many people, police, security, parents, etc., the details are pretty well etched into my memory, whether I like it or not. My goal is to draw attention to the true danger of these situations and hopefully empower anyone who might be in a similar situation to never question whether or not they're exaggerating the severity of the encounter after the fact. This was my initial reaction. Let me stress I would never falsify an experience of this caliber simply for the attention, as it is demeaning and disrespectful to other victims that have struggled through similar situations. 
Thank you all for the kind words and support. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 281. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Just an update for those wondering, finally managed to get my bike, also managed to break it within 10 minutes, but it's totally repairable, it's still completely rideable. And it's going to take me a while to get used to riding it again because I am way more out of shape than I realised. Okay, with that I'm going to head off for now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves.